Hey everyone, I'm Jerry Thompson, and today I'm going to give you a deck tech on Simic Midrange. Uh, Team Liquid recently dipped their toes into the MTG Esports waters by starting uh, their own, maybe what will end up being a tournament series in a thing called Hit the Deck. And that took place last Sunday. I registered for that. I thought it would be just like a, a cool event, and I am always willing to support like outside organizations coming into Magic and you know, supporting it and trying to help make it the best place that it possibly can be. So uh, it ended up being a very small tournament, just eight rounds, uh, or eight players, sorry, and was kind of like this round robin sort of thing. So I recorded the videos for those with commentary, and I thought it would be cool to also post those on YouTube. But first, I want to bring you the deck tech. And this is basically the deck that I've been working on the most as of late. It's the deck that I've been winning the most with on ladder by far. I think it is very consistent, very powerful, uh, for, especially for just a, a two-color deck with good mana, good acceleration, late game, card advantage, like removal. You basically have like the whole package in Simic. And... The way this deck actually first came on my radar was when Brad Nelson played it uh, to the top four of Fandom Legends when he lost to Brian Gottlieb playing the Esper Dance of the Man's deck. And up until that point, Brad was 6-0. and And his deck just looked very streamlined, very good. So I just took his deck as is and started playing with it. And, you know, the, the metagame changed a decent amount since then. And also past this weekend, it is going to change again because Brian Gottlieb also won another Phantom Legends tournament, this time with Golos. So uh, things are going to be a little bit different. And the list that I played in the, the Team Liquid thing is also going to change. So uh, again, on the screen, this is Brad's original list. This is what I was starting from. And then right here is the list that I played in the Team Liquid event. And I'm going to talk about the list that I would play going forward. So some slight changes here. Uh, basically, the deck has 12 mana creatures to and 25 land, which is pretty heavy, but you basically want to hit all your land drops and just get to uh, a point in the game where you can start casting giant Hydroid Crises. Crises. And uh, you have a lot to do with your mana, basically. So I, I very rarely feel like, oh, I'm super flooded. There's not a whole lot I can do. Uh, because you basically always have something going on. So uh, I like the fact that this deck gets to play a high land count, gets to play a lot of mana sources, and still not really suffer from that very much. Because you have a lot of heavy hitting cards, and you're, you're the aggressor in a lot of matchups. You're putting your opponents under pressure and everything, so... Uh, you don't necessarily need to be controlling every single thing that they're doing. You just need a reasonable curve and some mana and your cards will basically take care of the rest of themselves. So uh, right now, I basically feel like there are four big strategies in standard and Simic is definitely one of them. Uh, either, you know, Simic with a white splash for Teferi and things along those lines or just normal Simic and uh, those decks tend to look pretty different because even... Uh, Brad's list that he played, he had Brazen Borrower, which not a lot of other folks have, have really been playing, and you see more Questing Beasts showing up in a lot of people's lists, and it was not a card that I liked very much because uh, it basically just like hit them for four and then died, whereas things like Wicked Wolf, Brazen Borrower, they, like, they do things to the battlefield, and then they provide a body, whereas the Questing Beast was just like this chip shot, but now... With uh, the Golo stack in the mix, with Field of the Dead, Questing Beast's Evasion is actually super relevant, and you really want a way to pressure your opponent after they sweep your board with the, the big giant slap em ups guy. So, uh, Questing Beast back in the deck, uh, I, I, I'm glad, because it is a powerful card. I would like for it to be good in the metagame, but uh, for that week in between the two fandom events uh it was it was just not that great for me and now i think that it's really it's time to shine again so uh you know brian gottlieb just turning the metagame on its head every single week but uh next three decks are uh two of the decks that brian played esper dance of the manse and the golos field of the dead deck both of those decks are very good i know that uh both decks when he played them in the respective fandom tournaments he thought that he had a good matchup against simic and I think that's probably true 
for the decks that people were playing before. However, once you correct uh, for the fact that those decks do exist now and you start playing things like Disdainful Stroke instead of Negate and in much higher quantities and Tamiyo to get them back and stuff like that, I think uh, Simic gets a little bit closer to even, if not just becoming an outright favorite in those sorts of matchups. So uh, regardless, Golos and Esper are definitely two big decks. They they have you know the most pedigree behind them, right? Because they have won basically the only standard tournaments that have taken place thus far. So uh, they are going to be very popular. People are playing them a ton on ladder. You will run into them a bunch. So it is very, very good to be prepared for those decks. And then the other deck is actually just a loose classification of decks where it's just black X midrange. Uh, anything with Knight of the Ebon Legion and maybe even like Rotting Regisaur, Spawn of Mayhem, uh, a bunch of removal spells, some card advantage. Those decks take a lot of different forms. And I think it's only a matter of time before people actually find uh, close to like a consensus best build. But for right now, your opponent goes Swamp, Knight of the Ebon Legion. Like you can maybe name half the cards in their deck, if that, because you will not know exactly what you're up against. But uh, for the most part, those decks play out roughly the same way. You know, they're trying to put pressure on you, disrupt you a little bit by killing your stuff. And then post board, they're going to have access to a lot of removal and some more card advantage things. Uh, sometimes you see like Cavalier of Night and Rankle and stuff like that. Uh, so they are basically the, the aggro deck against Simic where they are going to try and get under you. They're going to try and clear the way with the removal spells, uh, but they do still have some late game that can back it up. So you have to be careful against those decks, again, especially since you don't really know uh, what their combination is. But yeah, those four decks for sure are the most popular decks that I've played against on the ladder at least. And obviously there are a lot of decks out there. People are still uh, trying to find their footing in new standard. I mean, there's a lot of Fire of Invention decks. There's a lot of Mono Red Cavalcade. People are still experimenting with Knights and stuff like that. So the format is very much wide open, but uh, those four decks are primarily what I have built my deck to be good against because that's maybe like half the metagame and... Uh, Simic is just so good in general. Like, you have Oko, you have Wicked Wolf, Nissa, Hydra Crisis, like, all of these wonderful cards that tend to just incidentally give you a lot of game against some of the weaker decks that people might be trying out. So, uh, I do like this build. The, the one weird thing I have is, uh, two copies of Once Upon a Time, which Brad did not play, but most of the other Simic pilots have, and... It's a good card in your opening hand, obviously, because you just get a free impulse, and typically you are either looking for your third land or a mana creature to accelerate you, or a Hydra Crisis as a big payoff, maybe a Wicked Wolf to, to kill something in the meantime. So Once Upon a Time does find the majority of the cards that you are looking for, and then even late game, you're going to have access to a decent amount of mana, so even drawing this card on like turn 6, turn 7, turn 8 is usually not that big of a deal, especially when you have something like Nissa already on the battlefield, and at that point the mana's just kind of trivial. And you're you're just digging for Krasis, basically, and not a whole lot else. So I think the card is worthy of inclusion. Um, I would probably play at least one copy and would consider playing as many as four, and I've played four in a few different versions, but the thing that i found is that a lot of my sideboard cards are not actually creatures, they're spells. So it is a little awkward to play this card in your main deck that is just automatically going to get sideboarded out once you, you know, play against uh, another Simic deck where you want a bunch of Aether Gusts or a Golos deck where you want a bunch of Disdainful Strokes and Tamios and stuff. So uh, I'm, I'm really not sure what the right number of the card is. It is a very unique card, not something we have had access to before. So I look forward to actually playing with it more and trying to figure it out. But I think that like one or two copies is very low opportunity cost. It is not really going to bite you all that often. And it's it's kind of free, you know, just like a, a very low cost inclusion. Uh, so I, I would recommend trying the card out, at least, if you have not already. And then if you're playing the, the banned versions, that's Splash for Teferi. That's a little more difficult because you have more non-creature, non-land cards in your deck. So you might not have the option between like, oh, do I want this mana dork or this land or this threat? It might just be like, well, you get a land and I'm going to show you a bunch of planeswalkers and that's all it is. You know, you just get to get a land and not really get any selection out of it. So 
Obviously, the, the more creatures and lands that you have to hit in your deck, the more options you're going to have anytime you actually resolve the card. And with things like Brazen Borrower, Wicked Wolf, Questing Beast, Hydroid Crisis, they, they provide you like a, a very wide variety of options. And you see people praising Once Upon a Time with things like Murderous Rider, right? Because you get to use this thing that's like an impulse for creatures or lands for something that is actually just a hero's downfall. And it feels a lot of the same way with Borrower, Wicked Wolf, and Hydra Crisis. So uh, definitely give the card a try if you have not yet. Um, but that's that's kind of it for the main deck. It's basically just like you're playing the best cards, right? Like Wicked Wolf, especially as you'll see in the, the videos that I recorded in the Liquid Tournament, Wicked Wolf just reminds me of kind of a new Reflector Mage where you can certainly play things that are weak to it, that is allowed, but you are going to get punished. And you will get punished repeatedly. And... It's not even like Reflector Mage where it was just kind of like this dead card against control decks because you're making food through the Goose or Oko or whatever, and then you just have this threat that's indestructible in the face of uh, Kaya's Wrath or, again, big giant slap em up dude. So uh, the Wolf is also just still very threatening against control decks, which is kind of wild, and it's part of the reason why it makes it so good and why I have basically... Uh, come around from like, oh, I definitely want to start like two of these for the creature decks and maybe sideboard the other two to I'm just playing all four main because it's basically good against everyone. Uh, but other than that, we have a sideboard. Uh, Veil of Summer, decent against Thought Erasure, although a lot of the Thought Erasure decks also have Teferi Time Raveler, so it makes it kind of awkward, but I still think that you want some copies there because they also have like Oath of Kaya and Murderous Rider. Uh, it's possible that maybe you only want two copies in matchups like that, but against Mono Black, I think you want a bunch of them, especially post-board when they have a bunch of Noxious Grasps, and this is, you know, the, the good sideboard answer to their sideboard answer, right? So, uh, Veil of Summer uh, increases dramatically in post-board games, and like I said, I, I expect these black decks to be very popular, so I like having two to three copies of Veil on my sideboard. Aether Gust is kind of the go-to card for the Mirror and for the Mono Red decks, and I, I do like it a lot. Uh, either you can effectively memory lapse uh, Nyssa or a Wicked Wolf or whatever, or you can just clear out uh, a big Hydroid Crisis and try and set up like a two-turn lethal through that or something. Uh, so overall, just like a good tempo tool, good defensive tool. And then four copies of Disdainful Stroke. This is a lot. Uh, this is also a card that you could potentially use in place of some of the Aether Gusts, because it has a lot of applications in the Mirror Match too, uh, you can't necessarily counter everything with it, or remove every single threat from the battlefield like you would Aether Gusts. It's certainly more flexible, in True Mirrors at least. But Disdainful Stroke also counters a lot of the big stuff, so I could see a world where if you need more sideboard slots, you could trim a Veil, trim an Aether Gust, and instead of bringing in three to four Gusts in the Mirror Match, you could just bring in like two Gusts and two Strokes. Then I have a couple Tamiyos in the sideboard. This is decent against Esper. Uh, but the main reason I like it, actually, is because it's another threat that does not die to a sweeper, and it helps you against Doom Foretold. And uh, basically all you're trying to do against Esper, and to some degree Simic, or not Simic, uh, Golos, is set up a good board position and then protect it with Disdainful Stroke from one of their sweepers. And sometimes you can do that with, like, oh, I'll stack the food to my wolf, protect the wolf, and then I'll untap and either play a Nyssa or maybe, like, Oko one of my foods and attack you for seven. Uh, that's one way that you can play through their sweepers. But another one is just, like, having Tamiyo there to either dig for Disdainful Stroke or be able to minus to get Disdainful Stroke. And, again, uh, those decks have Teferi, so something you definitely need to be wary of. But I do think that... Tamiyo gives you a little bit of an extra insurance policy when playing against decks that Stroke is very good against, and you need Stroke in those matchups. You absolutely need them. If you draw one Stroke, I like your chances. If you draw two Strokes, I think it's just game over, basically. So having Tamiyo as fake Strokes, uh, I like a lot. And then at the top end, we have Agent of Treachery. Uh, this is a card that is obviously very strong, and again, one of those uh, like spell creatures basically that you can find with once upon a time so that's cool if there are matchups where you're not actually boarding in a bunch of spells but you are boarding in agents uh, you can actually keep in the once upon a times and be able to find this thing which is nice I have three copies I think it's one of the best cards in the mirror match again kind of doing the same thing that the Aether Gust does where you're just clearing out like a big Hydra Crisis and trying to clear the way but uh, this one actually just like takes their Crisis or takes their Nyssa so Agent and Treachery is very nice and for a little bit, again, that week in between fandoms, I had mass manipulation 
because I thought it was basically the the Simic Mirror Breaker. It's it's hard to cast, but they basically have no way to stop it from resolving. And if X is two or more, I think it's just game over. Whereas uh, Agents, they can potentially just beat through it uh, if you're already behind. But Agents has more applications in more matchups where you can actually just board this in against Golos and take their field of the dead, set them back a mana. And I think that's really huge, really impactful in, in that matchup. So I like having agent and treachery for that deck. Uh, but yeah, that's about it. This is, this is what I've been playing on, on ladder lately. I uh, haven't been able to get uh, a ton of reps in. I hit platinum last season and then I already made it to gold again this season, basically playing exclusively Simic. Although like, uh, well, I mean, I guess my wins were almost exclusively Simic, and then me splashing around with various other decks caused me to lose ranks, which I then had to earn back with Simic. So uh, this deck has been very good to me. I think it has game against basically everything, and I think that you are probably doing yourself a disservice if you do not at least try out this deck. And again, this is the, fifth, the, the 75 that I would recommend uh, currently, especially for the latter. I'm not sure how things are going to really shake up. Uh, in real life, but I have SCG Philly this weekend, so uh, we'll see. And then also, if y'all want to check out the the Team Liquid stuff and the things that they're doing in the Magic community, I, I highly recommend doing that too because I got to talk with some of the people involved, and uh, they, they they seem great. You know, it seems like they really do love Magic and appreciate Magic, and the event was a lot of fun. And the vods from that event will be posted in the next couple of days. And enjoy. Let me know how it goes.